Do you want to see a train wreck? You've come to the right channel. Welcome to Woods Creek Workshop. My name is Yu Chul. Today we're continuing the work on the Cincinnati tool and cutter grinder and it has a nasty surprise for us. Learn from my mistake. I should have uh, caught it sooner, but sometimes that's how life turns out, especially when you ignore all the warning signs. So let's get started. I started cleaning up the saddle and I decide to strip the paint from this area. It's like a front entryway to your house. Every time you come to it, this is going to be in your face. In the face! In the face! And you want it to look good. I want it to start from bare metal. I simply use this wood chisel and I would just go and scrape the paint. Before we remove the saddle from the base, we do want to clean off some of the really greasy, gunky stuff. Just because it's easier to do uh, when it's sitting up here. When I'm cleaning a machine, I use a number of different cleaning agents. Windex, sometimes I use Purple Power. Now keep in mind, it, it, can use, it works great if you use full strength. Uh, however, it will react on your painted surface. It'll make the paint, uh, paint soft. It'll even soften the body filler underneath it. So bare steel works great. If you're gonna use it on painted surface, you do wanna dilute it. Most time I use mineral spirits. It doesn't evaporate fast, gives me plenty of time to scrub. Acetone, I don't like the smell of it, I don't like to use it, but sometimes you just have to use it. There's also dedicated wax and grease remover you can buy from automotive paint supply stores. Uh, they work great as well. But you're gonna have to put some more elbow grease into it. Steel brush, big plastic brush, little plastic brush, and sometimes Popsicle sticks like this. It's good for scraping hardened uh, grease out of little crevices and things. And you know what? My wife just informed me that I can buy these at a craft store. All this time I've been eating popsicle fudge sticks just so I can have the stick. What a letdown. Mineral spirit. gonna take multiple iterations. If you got neighborhood kids, you can pay them a buck to do this for you. It'd be highly worth it. Now let's take a look at this chip because this is a good example. We can do our best and clean and remove all the grease, but we can't just apply a filler there and paint because it's not gonna stick. What you don't see is along the perimeter, the oil has seeped underneath the paint. See? The paint just crumbles because it's all oil under there. So after I do the initial degreasing, I'm going to have to uh, go through each of those and peel back as much as I can to expose to the outer edge of the however much the oil's spread. The problem is my OCD just won't let me ignore it, you know. I'm trying to do as much as I can before I remove the saddle because it's just a convenient work height and everything. Ideally, I would remove the hand controls and disassemble this collar completely so I can do body paint work and clean these up. Unfortunately, I tried for a couple of days and I just couldn't succeed. See, these are installed with these uh, big taper pins and no matter what I just couldn't get it out. Uh, I tried heat, a uh, number of different approaches and I failed. What can I say? But that's okay. We don't need to remove it. Uh, it just gets in the way a little bit but we'll find a way, way to work around it. But before we paint the saddle we do want to clean these up polished. That way we don't accidentally damage the paint. Uh, my approach, it's up to you how you want to do it, is I'm using here 500 grit wet and dry uh, sandpaper. I went around and cleaned up the collar and uh, I'll probably polish it more. Uh, maybe go to a thousand grit and then uh, hand polish. But as far as the rest of it, uh, I'm gonna use a different tool. Let me show you. I got a Scotch-Brite wheel. This one is green. Uh, I believe it is uh, more gentler than maroon. 
and uh, this is the electric die grinder. Uh, you can do this by hand with Scotch-Brite, but this is what I'm using. So we'll just go around and do that in all four locations. I want to show you how I clean these neurals. These are uh, like 30 degrees this way and that way. I use straight brush on my drill and I angle it the same angle as the neural. And when you're done, you go the other way. And just keep going around until you're done. Well, I started cleaning the saddle. It's uh, pretty nasty, but as you can see, that half I already did some cleaning. And that side, probably 71 years worth of gunk. And I know what you're wondering. Yucho, how'd you get that so clean? Well, I'm gonna share it with you. La Prima El Bao Grease. I found it on the internet. You can also get it in yellow and red, but I prefer the white. That way, if I spill it on the floor, it doesn't stain it. But if you really want to take it up a notch, you can also use mineral spirits, steel brush, some scotch bright pad, your dad's favorite flathead screwdriver, knife, putty, knife, chisel, toothbrush. You pretty much use everything you got. Now I'm going through and assessing the condition of the paint. Uh, I'm not going to strip it completely. That's just too much work. But I also don't want to paint over any loose chips. So here's a trick. Take a wooden chisel, pick a side, somewhere like there, and just go around tapping it. If it comes off when you tap, then it's not gonna last. If you tap, well, none of it's gonna last. But like right there, it's not chipping. It'll be all right. Seems like right here it's pretty uh, loose. And then you just go like this. Home, home on the ring. I don't know, the whole thing may end up coming off. In preparation for removing the saddle, we need to remove the lead screw. To do that, we're gonna remove this rear handle. Now I've been soaking on this coil uh, oil for a week now, so that set screw came loose. Took a bit of a persuasion. And it came out. And there's a key. Let me rotate the front. Then this wheel, dial wheel, should just come out. The service manual says to remove this lock ring. The set screw, I just got it loosened. I tried to remove the lock nut and the entire shaft was turning, so I had to put a piece of two by four under the handle in the front. I'll include a picture. The heater kicked on. Found my adjustable um, angle grinder wrench. It's a perfect fit. I should be able to just unscrew the lead screw from the front. Let me tap from the back. There it goes. There's a lead screw, there's a taper roller bearing in the front, and there's another one at the back that remains with the saddle. <sighs> at this point, the saddle is ready to be lifted off. I'll have to use an engine hoist or something because I didn't have my Wheaties this morning. The way the chains are hanging from the engine hoist, it was turning the saddle. So that's what that blue strap is here to keep that from turning. Come on, baby. We want to move the base back a little bit. Mm -hmm. 
Well, let's take a quick look. There's the lead screw nut, but I want to do a quick wipe down of the ways and see what it looks like. I see scraping marks from the factory. You can still see the factory scraping mark. They were scraped for oil retention. I still see a lot of scraping on this side as well. Those are definitely good signs. The right side, which is the flat side, not as much uh, scraping as on the left side, but it's not as bad as I thought it was gonna be. That's awesome. A lot of gunk though. We have to clean all this up. Any volunteers? We're gonna remove the lead screw nut right here. It's not much of a nut. It's more like a block. Anyway, it's held in there with set screws right here. It's been painted over, so the threads are threads have paint on it. There's a lot of gunk here. We're gonna scrape it off. Nice. You know, I was thinking if baby pig is called piglet, how come? Baby turtles are not called turtlet. I just don't know. I gave this area the initial cleaning. It's got quite a bit more way to go, but let me show you how I'm cleaning it. I'm using gray scotch Bright pad. This first round, there's still a lot of grit on there, so you have to do probably two or three more rounds with it. I started cleaning this side and I thought I'd get the camera rolling again because this groove right here was just nasty. That is not a precision surface. Again, scotch bright pad. Steel brush. It looks like I'm gonna have to do more scrubbing here, but it's already starting to look so much better. Well, I figured out why it's not only rough here, but low compared to the rest of it. There's a hole right here, and that is a, a, for lubrication. So when you use your one-shot uh, lube, it lubes the ways and oil flows over and gets into that hole and it lubricates the shaft that goes this way that raises and lowers the work head up and down. Well, this one is packed with grinding dust. I just don't think that was a good design. Again, I have a limited experience, but it's so easy for grinding dust to accumulate there as uh, you saw and it's just going to block the oiling port. So we're going to have to take that all apart and clean it out. Let's talk a little bit more about the oiling method. When I was cleaning this way right here, I noticed this part was significantly lower and it was machined that way from the factory maybe 30, 40 thousandths, it just falls that way. And I know it was done at the factory because the scraping still exists on top of that. If it was done by uh, someone else after it left the factory, I wouldn't expect to see the flaking. Then it occurred to me that in that defect or flaw was intentionally introduced to force the oil to fall into that groove right there so you can oil that hole. I just, I can't think of uh, any other machines that I've seen before where they sacrifice part of the way to divert the oil to a different location. It's pretty interesting. And it was time to get the belt tensioning mechanism freed up. There are two bolts there, there that you loosen and this lever activates the rack and pinion system that actually moves the entire motor assembly up and down and that's how you tension the drive belt. And they were kind of stuck but I got them working and as you can see I was able to slide the belt off the pulley. And once you remove those four screws you can remove this beautiful cover plate.
and there were some warning signs. Let me bring you closer. First warning sign was all the rust and the powder. That's never a good thing. Next came the spindle noise. That right there is the sound of a spindle that's completely gone. The bearings are gone, they're dry, it's just destroyed. No life. Well, unfortunately, this didn't turn out the way I was hoping for, but sometimes that's how life is. Yeah, I'm disappointed that machine is likely uh, not salvageable, but I guess I'm more disappointed that I didn't catch it sooner. I mean, that's something that I would normally check first, and I just had a you know excuse that, hey, the tensioning system was locked. Uh, let me move on to other part of the machine instead of getting that working first and uh, checking the spindle. So I uh, violated one of my own rules and I'm going to have to uh, reflect on that and live with it a bit. No, seriously. These things happen. 71-year-old machine, you know, what are you going to do? Curl up into a ball and just cry? No, we're going to forge ahead. Uh, we're going to take this apart and see what it looks like. Probably not salvageable or rebuildable, but at least we'll know how it's built and uh, what kind of thought went into it when Cincinnati built this machine. So let's go. You don't mind that heater that's blowing, but we're going to first take, uh, take these uh, dust caps off. They're one on each side. The factory manual says the spindle is lubricate for life, never needs oiling. And they also describe it as a cartridge system. The thought is in production, you can completely remove the spindle, put one in there, swap it out with known good one, because it comes in a, I guess that's called a cartridge. You gotta break off all the paint we go. It's machine thin in the middle, thick. It is just a dust cap. But look at that. It's definitely uh, has had liquid moisture. Maybe coolant? Yeah, that is not normal. Let me clean that off a little bit. I'll have to remove the cover on the other side before we can move on. Now I did go ahead and remove the cover from the right side, the other side, and I want to show you what that looks like. Look at that. That line right there and build up, is the, there was a liquid sitting there for a long time and it just dried up and that's the, that's the level line. It goes all the way across. No wonder the bearings didn't survive. I made two pin spanners. They're not gonna win any beauty contest, but that's all right. Uh, it's identical on that side, except one has two smaller pins on the outer uh, diameter. They're just pressed in. The outer piece is stationary, but the inner piece spins with a spindle. That's why I needed to make two of them so I can lock the other end. Let's see if it works. I turned the head around so you can see this side better. I know. Don't ever say I didn't do something nice for you. Nasty. Now let's take the outer ring off. Old grease, just nasty. Now we need to keep track of how these came off so we can put them back exactly the way they were. We don't want to swap parts left and right. We want to keep them the same. That gives us a higher chance of having any success. I got the other end inner piece loosened. 
it failed to occur to me that that is a left-handed knot to align with left-handed thread here. Anyway, like I said, there's nothing to grab, so I'm just using uh, one of those rubber strap branches. If I was to use this a lot, I'd probably make it a little bit more ergodynamic. Now this is a non-spinning piece, so hmm, is it right-handed or left-handed? Well, that one is a normal right-handed thread. That'll just totally confuse you, you know? Right, left, right, right, left. Ooh, there's some oozing. Huh, interesting really thin hmm. feels like water has gotten to it that's definitely water some chunks there's definitely water don't forget to like and subscribe I'd appreciate it but if you don't want to I also understand all right let's see if we can get the spindle removed from the housing now these there's one here and here these uh, hold on to the spindle. Spindle has a little indentation so it keeps them in place. But these uh, actually tighten the clamshell. And when you get it ready to remove, you loosen these and you use these screws to jack into it and it spreads the clamshell apart. Here's a spindle. Here are the holes for the top screws to grab onto and keep it in place. It smells nasty. I think that's the theme of this grinder. We'll take a look at this more closely. I removed some of the grease that was on the outside just so I can handle it better. This side is the left, this is the right side. Now that's when you're facing the machine. This is the side where there was a grinding wheel earlier in the video and this side there was nothing on it maybe that uh, was telling us something let me show you i'm gonna put the microphone right up against this portion here that side is shot the right side there's nothing there's no movement that i can detect now let's see how it sounds when we spin it not good let's put it on the left side this side is completely shot. There's a ticking mark on the right side. So this right side is not as bad. That's probably why the previous user was using this side to grind. This shot, this side is just completely gone. And that's also where the side that we had water. So we're gonna pull all these apart and see what it looks like inside. Let's see if we can remove this uh, bearing retainer. Yeah, it's moving. Well, this side is coming out. I'm just using my bare hand to turn this. Doesn't want to turn. Oh yeah, that's pretty bad. Let's take a look at the spindle again. I noticed discoloration on this side. There isn't any over here. And I thought, well, what is that? And then I looked at the bearing retainer. It's clearly not similar type of bearing as what's on the other side. And then I see a spacer at the end of the bearing. I think the spacer was moving around causing that abrasion. I did look in the manual. Uh, it's not clear. The manual part number 189 it shows quantity of four bearing ball new departure. 
and it says these bearings are matched on pairs, early machines only. But then the other bearing that is listed has a quantity of two for the whole machine, SKF, self-aligning. I was able to just simply push these out with my fingers. It was a snug fit, but it came out this side. Uh, since this is one ball or one bearing, uh, it's not playing nice, so I'm just using a socket here. As you can see, it's wider with the spacer. It's the same width. I've been soaking the bearings in isopropyl alcohol overnight, but before I did that, I rinsed them out with mineral spirits and some alcohol. Let me show you. Aside from the color, it's nasty. There's a lot of, lot of stuff floating around. A little bit gritty. Reminds me of fake beef gravy. Mm. Let's take him out. Still has stuff on it. In case you didn't know, a lot of these spray nozzles just screw onto isopropyl alcohol container. And always use 91%, 93%, whichever comes highest. Don't use the 70%, too much water. A lot of stuff floating around in there. Now remind me to wash this mason jar before I put it back in the kitchen. My wife will get mad. Now that I got some of that nastiness off, I'm able to uh, read the numbers a lot better. Um, it is again SKF 6305, but I hope you can see. It's hand engraved on there also in an inner ray 6305 dash or slash C783. G1. Same thing with this. And they were oriented back to back. And the both inner and outer races have marks on them. One, two. With the, those are the run out marks with the, the least amount of run out. And same thing on this as well. Right here and right there. So when you assemble the spindle, you have all those oriented in the same directions. So your spindle moves this way versus this way. This one is 2305 SKF also. It is double ball bearing. I don't see any engraved marks on it. It does say NW05, but I haven't been able to really determine what that means. But this one does not seem to be spec'd out at a higher rate than these two. And that is consistent with what other people have uh, experienced on their Cincinnati grinders as well. These balls are just completely gone pitted. It's got a lot of things going on. And remember this is the end that we saw water. That one definitely needs to go. These, I have to do some more cleaning, but these do not feel as bad. Still needs more scrubbing. You know what I need? I need an ultrasonic cleaner. Also right there on the chamfer is hand engraved L81 on this one. I can't make out what's a, what it says on this one. So these two, I'm mean, gonna have to do more cleaning. I'm not sure if they're salvageable. This one, definitely gone. Well, there you have it. We have a huge problem and I'm not sure what the right path forward is yet. I'll be spending some time researching into the bearings and keeping in mind that a lot has changed in the quality of bearings in the last 70 years. What was considered high precision back then may be more common today. Never know. Maybe. Probably not. What would you do? Would you rebuild or move on? Please comment below. And until next time, thanks for watching.